I want to introduce Swami Sridharananda Ji to you this evening. He will give you personal reminiscences of a Swami with whom he lived for many years. Swami Sridharananda Ji is the head of the Vedanta Center of Sydney and Melbourne, Australia. Before he went to Australia, he was the head of the Ramakrishna Mission Lucknow. As I told you on Sunday, he was a great, he is a great builder. He built the, one of the biggest polyclinics in Asia, Vivekananda Polyclinic. Then he built a huge Ramakrishna's temple. Then he was sent to Australia. I knew Swami from my nine early monastic lives from 1960s early 60s. Though we never lived together, but we are very close. Whenever I went to India, I always visited Lucknow when Swami was there. Swami has a great advantage to sark some Swamis who are the disciples of Holy Mother, disciples of Vivekananda, and his guru was the disciple of Swami Vivekananda. In our language there is a saying, ivory is very expensive. When that ivory is covered with gold, it becomes more expensive, more valuable. So when you see a monk, a holy person, is very precious. When that monk is endowed with learning, he becomes more precious. So the Swami endows both. The holy person, at the same time, very learned. Swami knows many languages. This morning we took Swami to our basilica and the arts and the old cathedral and down in the near the river. He traveled all over the world. So Swami, I request Swami to speak his reminiscences about the Swami he met. The transition when he handed over to him Dear friends, now I feel very homely to call you my dear friends, having been with you for some time. Yesterday, we had an occasion to discuss upon what Vedanta is. What relevance does it have in our day-to-day -day life? And also, I had the occasion to touch upon the various structured methodologies by means of which we ordinary humans do have an opportunity to raise our level of awareness from where we are to what we are truly and really the divine. That process of manifestation of the divine within yourself is a process of spiritual discipline. And from ancient times all over the world, we know that the newcomers in this faith, newcomers who want to build up their spiritual life, apart from rational approach to teach them, to educate them, so that they can appreciate the spiritual values of life, understand the subtleties, the nonsense of spiritual life, 
they must also be told or they must be exposed to see a realized soul, how they behave, how they conduct themselves, and etc. So the Ramakrishna order to which we belong, we follow the same traditional methods. If you are desirous of being a monk, being a Swami, renouncing your past way of life and living, and dedicate yourself to God, then you are put to certain preliminary, I would say, observations and investigations as to what is your tendency is, what is your temperament is, are you highly excitable, are you extremely sentimental, can you take the toughening of this life after all this is gone through, then we youngsters, we are attached to, personally, some very advanced spiritual souls. I do not know how dear it happened, but I know this much, I am one of those very fortunate few who had the opportunity of living with, interacting with, as a personal valet to look after the comforts of that old man, that realized soul, and in the process be exposed to the way of living, way of behaving, way of thinking of those senior realized swamis. So what it is, to live with them dears is not a matter of inspiration, it is a matter of education. And that education, excuse me, is of a different type, that is, your behavior pattern will be watched by him. As you very well know from common sense, that the behavior pattern is guided or molded by your thinking pattern. And that thinking pattern emanates from the spiritual values that you hold to your heart. So it is in three different grades that that senior realized soul assesses you, evaluates you, and then he tries to help you. The language of help may be very soft, may be very sweet, may be normal, may be so harsh that it is almost unbearable. But they do not expect any return from you. All they expect is to make a man of you. So, dears, it is not a process of inspiring the youngsters. It is a process of building up the youngsters' spiritual foundation. And that is what the interaction between what we call in India, Shevaka. Shevaka means one who serves. That is, one who looks after the comfort and the convenience of that elder Swami, a realized soul. That is how I had the fortune of first being introduced to a Swami first time in my life. I was in search of a book published by Advaita Ashrama, and in search of that book, I went to a famous shopkeeper, a bookshop, bookstore, and they told me, why buy it from us? It will cost you such an amount of money. 
you better go to Advaita Ashram, the publishers, and as you are a student, you will get a 50% discount. Is it good enough? So I got the address from them and I reached that center. It was 5, 5.30 in the evening uh, in fall, I write this time, or a little later after summer, yeah, maybe August, September. And I met a Swami there. I reached the address. I found the door half open. I stood at the door thinking whether I should get in or not. And then I heard somebody typing. The tick tick noise of typing was audible. So I said, then somebody is in. I have no fear now. So I walked in. And immediately the typing noise stopped. And a Swami in his mid 40s, very elegant, extremely fair from the standard of an Indian and a tall, elegant person, he stood up dressed in girwa and asked me, what can I do for you, my dear? So as for Indian custom, I went to him, I bowed down, touched his feet and said, sir, I have come in search of a book. And then I could understand that the office and etc. were closed. So I told him, sir, if it is closed, if the office is closed, I'll come back tomorrow. Now, how could you say the office is closed? I am there to serve you. <laughs> so he asked me, what book do you want? I told him, this is the book that I want, Roma Rola's Life of Ramakrishna. Why do you think of buying it? We have a lending library. Why don't you take it, read it, and bring it back to me, and then you can follow up? I said, no, sir, I would like to possess it. Why? <coughs> I am told, sir, such books are lifelong companions. So he looked at me surprisingly. Oh, you want to make that book a lifelong companion? I said, yes, sir. Then he said, all right, as a student, I'll give you 50% discount. That was the first meeting with a Swami in my lifetime. Well, prior to that, if a Swami used to walk on that side of the road, I used to take this side. <laughs> but that first interaction was so soft and so sweet it did really impress me that my knowledge of what a Swami is or how a Swami conducts himself is totally wrong. He is something which I never thought of. He is more friendly than my friends, more understanding than anybody else. He wants to save my pocket money <laughs> by offering me 50% discount. That is how my journey of spiritual life started there. It was sometimes uh, mid-46, probably. And then I started interacting with him on those books and nothing else, but I kept myself confined to a discussion about that book and any other new publication that's coming up. And he told me, are you free at this time, every day? I said, yes, sir, I am. Look, I go out for a walk on the riverside. Would you kindly make it possible to come along with me? We will have a walk, we will have a chat, we will interact, and then you go your way to your home. I come back my way to my ashram. Will that be all right? Good enough? That is how it developed. That Swami, in the year 1948, 21st of February, 
with whom by that time I had developed a great strong intimacy and I accepted him as my guide, he was posted to San, San Francisco as an associate minister to Ashoka Dandaji Maharaj. So I missed him and we, there was no other way. He told me that, look, I have been chosen for this God work. I have no freedom to say no. That is wha how we are trained. So if you want to become a Swami, you will need some guide. You will need some help. There will be problems of adjustment because our way of life and your way of life is totally different. Why don't you take advantage of my presence here in India? So if you really mean to be a Swami, I would say make this an occasion to push yourself and come as fast as possible, as soon as possible. So that was a great uh, suggestion, very important suggestion in my life. And to cut a long story short, I came and joined that very center where he lived, the Advaita Ashram, on the 17th of November, 1947. So I had the fortune of living with him only for three months. During that period of three months, a very, very senior Swami of the Ramakrishna order, known as Swami Shantanandaji, had come to Belurumat for a short stay. As soon as he came to know about his stay in Belurumat, he rang me up and informed me that he wants to see me urgently. I shouldn't delay. So I came running to him. Yes, sir, what is it? Look, such and such a Swami is going to stay at Bedurumat for a short while. I thought I will introduce you to that Swami. And when I am gone, I am not available to you. If you have any problem, you can depend on him. And I was scared that I may not get another Swami, such a warm-hearted, sincere, helpful type. He kept in his mind that this is what I will be missing. So to protect me from that, he introduced me to Swami Shantanandaji, one of our most ancient Swamis of the order after the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. The first one was Swami Virajananda, the sixth president of the order, who was very, very kind to accept me as his disciple. And after that, Shantanandaji, Girijanandaji, and Vishuddhanandaji, three school friends, immediately after completing their 10th standard, three in a group went to the mother's place at Jarambati before 1910. It will be any time between 1905 to 1907. I'm not very really sure, but it was before 1910. So they went to Jairambati and Holy Mother blessed them. And there is a saying about Shantanandaji that, and it has been recorded because it was his own statement, that when the mother saw this boy in his early teens, he, she took him by his chin. It's a typical Indian motherly type of blessing, took him by the chin and kissed his, her own fingers and then kissed him in his forehead. And he, she made a wonderful comment, oh dear me, 
Sri Ramakrishna has sent to me another Baburam. Those who are familiar with the literature, Baburam Maharaj was Swami Prabhananda, one of our mighty souls, as it were. So that was the evaluation and assessment of the purity and the spiritual possibility of Swami Shantananda. He had come to Lurvat and Swami Shanta Swarupanandaji took me all the way to Belurmat to introduce me to him and everything. And the first thing he did was ask me to wait, went in his room, bought a mere small little paper, pack, paper piece packeted, folded, and what is it? Sri Ramakrishna's and Holy Mother's dust of their feet and tells me, you better open your mouth and I'll pour it there. Every cell of your body will be purified. That is what he told me. And I was so much touched that he, this is the first time he sees me and he's so interested in my welfare that he, at the starting of my spiritual life, wants to get every cell of my body purified from the dust of the Holy Mother's and Guru Maharaj Sri Ramakrishna's feet. Much later in life, I asked him, how did you retain it? He said, the Holy Mother had taken few pots of Ganga clay and had touched it and Guru Mahaja's feet. And the mother used to preserve it and have a small speck of it every morning before her prayers. And Shantanandaji, having heard from the Holy Mother this, he had few pots of clay, touched at Holy Mother's feet and keep it to himself. And that is how he could give that to me on my first very meeting. Good enough, Shantanandaji went back to Benares. Shanta Shurupanandaji came over to San Francisco and I was left alone in Advaita Ashram. By the time I have left my home and joined the order. After that, things moved a little fast and I was transferred to Benares Shivasra in Baranashi, the hospital. And to test my grit, whether I really mean to be a Swami or it was just a fad, or a fashion, I was given the job of a janitor to clean the soiled linen of our indigent rural patients. Well, no going back, and defeat is not what one wants. So I took it up and put my heart and soul into it, though the whole system revolted, the look, the stink, the dirt, everything. The whole system revolted, but no saying no to it. And I didn't know <coughs> that my seniors were keeping a sharp watch on me to find out how I am taking to this work. But if almost every day or every other day, there was an allied center, the same boundary wall, where there were doors to come in and come out, was known as the Thakurbai, the Mot Center, where Guru Mahaja's temple exists. Shantanandaji used to live at Mot on the third floor, top room, single room on the third floor. So every one or day after my work, 
I used to go and meet him. And he used to ask me, what are you doing, and this, and this, and this. And he tells me, when he hears, oh, what a blessed boy you are. Is this the blessing? <laughs> Clearly cleaning dirt. And it is so offensive, never done in my life. And this old man says, you are a blessed person. So I kept quiet after all. Some respect or reverence has to be shown. So he says, wouldn't you ask me why I say it is a blessing? So I said, no. I just kept quiet. Listen, this will be the best way of learning Swamiji's philosophy that work can be converted into worship. It is not what type of work you do, it is the attitude with which you do. That was the first lesson that I had from him. It is not what the type of work you do, but the attitude with which you do. You dedicate yourself that that so-called dirty work will teach you the methodology of converting your life into an endless worship of the divine. To be very honest with you, my dears, I did listen. It entered my brains all right, but it did not convince me. Neither did I understand how can such a dirty menial's work be converted into a worship of the divine. And that is what I will tell you now how he taught me to do that. So what happens as things developed at the age of 65 or so or 60 or so he developed tuberculosis. At that time all these medicines, streptomycin, INH, pass, and all that anti-tubercular drugs were neither discovered nor invented. So when one had a tuberculosis and it was declared when the sputum was positive, all that the society did was cast him away. Isolate him so that he doesn't become the cause of death for others. But as he was a very, very venerated, respected old Swami and very soft in nature, the other senior monks thought that let him be isolated all right, but let us not break this news to him. So. He was totally in the dark on medical grounds. He was asked to leave his room and go uh, into the hospital area and in the isolation ward. And I used to find that a boy, a servant in our kitchen, used to go and keep his breakfast in a tiffin carrier in front of his room in the veranda go away. Again, somebody would keep his food there in the veranda at much time. And he was all alone. I felt very bad. And one day, all the announcements and informations were we made in our dining hall. We were all gathered. So it was announced there because of certain unforeseen reasons, such and such a thing has happened. Swami Shantanandaji has been moved to isolation ward, and all of you will not talk about what has happened to him. We do not want that he knows it. 
that is the way they thought, the Swamis thought, they can ameliorate the feelings of the Swami. So I listened to that and we were asked not to visit him at all, not to visit him at all. It was a bit hard on me. I had no friend in the, under the sun. He was my only friend. And I was, and I am still a bit reserved, a bit shy. I don't open up much unless I'm sure. So I felt a bit cut up. Now where do I go? What a misfortune. This Swami, he's also in isolation and we are prevented from going to him. So one day I disobeyed and I went and saw him because I couldn't hold myself back. And I was all the time thinking, this old man, such a sweet man, I don't know how he is fending for himself. So one day I disobeyed and quietly walked into his room. He was absolutely euphoric. Are Shardin, you are here? What brings you here? As joyous, as aesthetic, as ever. I asked him, sir, I just wanted to see how are you, how are you keeping? Oh, by mother's grace, I'm in cloud nine. It's so peaceful here. Nobody bothers me. <laughs> I was stunned at his simplicity and the way he explained his own position to me. I came back took my night, kept on thinking. Next morning I made up my mind, I will offer my services to this one. I will care for him, I will look after him, I will serve him. And the first day's expression, oh how blessed you are, you are doing the janitor's job. Oh, now you will really understand how to convert work into an endless worship of the divine. So that impact and to some extent an element of sympathy and fellow feeling prompted me to make up my mind. So the two heads of the two centers, they met every evening, afternoon at four o'clock to share a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. So that was a time when they were very relaxed. I knew this is not a subject to be raised in a public place. Let me do it very quietly and softly. So I went there. What are you doing here? So I said, I have something to seek a favor from you. What is it? Sir, I'd like to serve Shantanandaji whole time. What? I repeat it again. Do you know what you are talking? I kept quiet. Are you going to kill yourself? Do you know what he's suffering from? What will happen to you if you are infected? No, no, stop all this stupidity. Get back to your work. I stood my ground and I very politely repeated that, sir, allow me to serve him. Who will be responsible for you? If you catch that infection, who will be responsible for you? I took my time and very politely said, regarding the technicalities of our organization, I was still a pre-probationer and my name was not enrolled in the register as a monk of this order. I said, sir, I am a pre-probationer. You have no responsibility for me. <laughs> and I assure you, sir, if you want a written declaration, 
I assure you, if I contact this disease, I of myself leave the organization. I will not be a cause of any problem to you. Now kindly do permit me. They were absolutely shocked. I kept my voice low. I was very collected, composed. They could sense the steely determination with which I have approached them with all humility, modesty, and submissiveness. They couldn't say no. That is how my fortune opened up. I went straight from there to Shantanandaji's room in isolation, and I told him, Maharaj, Maharaj, I have a good news for you. <laughs> what is that good news? I have prevailed upon the authorities to seek their permission and their blessing to be your shevak. You will be my shevak, but then I'll have to be responsible for your spiritual welfare. Then I was afraid he might say no. <laughs> so I said, sir, that is not my business. I know I'm indebted to you. Your selfless love had moved me the first day I saw you. And your guidance that I must learn to convert my life into an endless worship of the divine is still with me and I live with you to learn that art or, or that trick. So the wonderful understanding between the two and here the isolation room was about eight feet by eight feet square. At one side was his wooden takat, wooden bench, three feet by seven feet and he was there with his Indian <laughs> bed and all that. And I used to spread my blanket on the floor and slept on my arms. And I was in heaven. Within two or three days, I used to go and fetch his food from the kitchen. I used my discretion and chose brought it along, I saw that he eats well and all that, as an interaction grew very quickly and intimately. On the third day, or let me put it the other way, his routine of life was, he used to wake up any time between quarter to four, half past three to quarter to four in the morning, whether it is winter or summer is material. And then the doctors had advised him to have a glass of Horlicks, that nourishing drink which was very common those days. It still exists today. It's in 1948. <clears throat> and he says, look, Shalil, that was my pet name, the name that I got brought from my home. Look, Shalil. You are working so hard for me, you should also have some nourishment. So how that nourishment would come to me? Of one glass of, say, eight or ten ounces, a big glass, one glass of coffee, about one-third remains, and I must stand in his presence and eat from that glass. He didn't know. And I was told by the seniors, that your behavior pattern will be such that he must not have any doubt about what his disease is. So I said, yes, Maharaj, he is responsible for me now. <laughs> On the third day, he tells me, look, because of me, your life's routine is disturbed. You are trying to ally yourself, align yourself with my routine. So I'll teach you a secret. And that is what I was waiting for. <laughs> that was my intention, absolutely. Yes, Maharaj, what is it? That look, 
your time to sit peacefully and to meditate is now being disturbed. So could you do me a favor, dear? I'm going to do him a favor. What is that? Remember to utter your Ishtra Mantra with the inhalation and exhalation of your breathing. As long as you are alive, you will inhale and you will exhale. Now you synchronize with a continuing effort that you will remember your mantra when you inhale, you will remember your mantra when you exhale. Can you do that favor to me, dear? Notwithstanding what I am in for. I said, yes, Maharaj, definitely, I will do that. But to assure him is something and to practice it is something else. <laughs> Out of the blue, without any warning, Shalil, are you doing your Japam? No, sir, I've forgotten. <laughs> no complaint. Please remember, please practice. Again, all of a sudden, are you <laughs> forgotten? It continued. Once he told me, how can you make a Swami of yourself if you forget to remember God's name? How can you make a Swami of yourself? This is not expected of a novice. Take it seriously, Shalil. That is the reproach or the reprimand that I have from him. Now here starts the way he picked me up just because I am doing him some physical service. He is building up my spiritual life in return because he's receiving something, he has to pay back something. He receives the gross material help from me, and he opens up the door of spiritual treasure to me, how to build up a spiritual life. So this game continues. Shadil, are you? And he would complete, are you? It became a scare with me. <laughs> but to say no all the time after that reprimand doesn't behoove you. So my effort to remember continued. And remembering and forgetting. Remembering and forgetting. That was my position. What happened? I became very clever. When I was working outside the room, I felt free. He's not there to ask me. <laughs> as soon as I was on the doorstep, I became alert. I started repeating, now I'm entering near him, and I, he'll meet me, he'll ask me. But listen, dears, to such a charming situation. One day it so happened, as he, as he asked me, are you, I turned around and said, yes, sir. <laughs> he absolutely jumped on his bed. Have you, have you got into that habit? God bless you, carry on. As if it is his test, not mine. And when I'm speaking to you, I am remembering what had happened nearly 58 years ago. His face flushed. Oh, you are, you are. Thank God, carry on. That joy that I saw in his face, being a shevak, it is my duty to keep him happy. And if reciting the mantra makes him so happy, it became an added burden on to me. And then he told me, these are the 
little secrets of spiritual life. Then he told me, dear, if you can master this art, that the force of repetition will generate a force of habit, this habit will mature into second nature, and ultimately it will be natural, spontaneous with you. You need no effort to remember God, and he will be a part and parcel of your being because you are aware of him all the time. And because of his continuing attention on me, in about three or four months' time, I used to find that at midnight, if I wake up, somebody is telling the mantra in me. The force of habit has taken hold of me, as the force of forgetfulness had a hold on me, the force of remembering had a hold on me. That was the first habit that he inculcated in me within two to three months' time. And when he was absolutely satisfied that I am at it, they used to smell it, you know, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But they had such a, hey, they could smell what is going around in my heart. After that, he takes up the next step. What is that? Apart from reciting God's name all the time, whatever you do as a sense of duty, convert it into a worship of the divine. I used to clean his pots and pans. He was almost bedridden. And he used to tell me, attitude that matters, not the type of work. Let that attitude be. With the repetition of the name, everything that you do every moment of your life, always remember you are offering it to your God and thereby be a pursuer of perfection, a pursuer of excellence, and convert every item of your life as a perfect, pure offering to God. Purity lies in your attitude. And perfection lies in your behavior pattern. So then he explained to me, this behavior pattern is motivated by your thinking pattern. And that thinking pattern must be anchored to spiritual values. You will not find these statements, my dear friends, in any of the scriptures. It only comes from a life lighting up another life. And that is how my life started under his care, his guidance, and his deep abiding selfless affection. He expected nothing from me in return. All he expected that I make a man of myself, succeed in the profession that I've chosen for myself. This is how my life was being spent with him in isolation, away from the world, away from the society, and the world really disappeared for me also. He, his words, the work that I have to do for him, that is all my life rotated around, and no regard for personal hygiene, no regard for personal health, so that he does not have a chance even to find out what he is suffering from. And I could camouflage it perfectly well because I was also 
absolutely without any fear. How can I fear? I was so saturated with this divine joy living with that person who has taken charge of my spiritual life. Where is the scope and space for fear? There's no space left in me. So I enjoyed myself. In the meantime, what happened? Virajanandaji, the sixth president, he had an extreme soft corner for Shantanandaji. They were Guru Bhais, as you know, both of them were devotees and disciples of the Holy Mother. Virajanandaji started working upon this idea how could Shantananda be sent to a best sanatorium in India where he will be cared for. And he found out that the sent, uh, I'm sorry, King Edward the Seventh TB Sanatorium at Kosoli near Simla, on way to Simla from Delhi, three stations below. That was a famous TB Sanatorium in India at that time. And Virajanandaji found out a cottage for him. In those days, it was really princely, $1,000 a month, uh, 1,000 rupees a month. That was a fortune in that time, India, at that day. He found out, he found out how to fund it, fund it, and he sent a word to me through Madhavanandaji that tell Khagen, tell Shantananda, that we have been able to find out a better place for him than Benaras. When he came to know he has to leave Benaras, he was started weeping. I am here in Benaras to die, why they want me to leave Benaras? But I said, Sir, President Maharaj has decided for you, we have no freedom. Oh yes, yes, you are right, mother wants it, that's why the President thinks that way. Immediately it was link up. The Divine Mother wants it. That's why it is being. So it's all right. All right with me. No lamentation. We took him there. Now comes the catch. At the railway station in Kosoli, the sanatorium people came to take him home. As soon as I brought him down from the railway coach, he saw Edward the Seventh TB Sanatorium Kosoli, the <coughs> ambulance, the two stretcher bearers with their logo here. He looks at it. Surely, who are they? What can I say? I tried to escape. I said, Shrank Maharaj, probably this is available in this country. So they have come to take you to your place. Such a confidence, simple. All right. But how long can I? When the ambulance was entering the gate, a huge gate with a board, King Edward the VII TV Sanatorium Kasoni. He looked at it, oh, so here am I, here I am, and he kept quiet. He was taken to his cottage, he was put on his bed, a beautiful, excellent place. You see the Himalayan snows, the Himalayan landscape from all sides of your room. Oh, it was heaven for him. And I was also very euphoric, Maharaj, what a wonderful place to stay at this end. He was absolutely in wrong. No response. All my tricks, all my charms, all my cleverness, no response. Lost to himself. Now pardon me and share with me being a very intelligent, brainy chap that I think of myself to be, I thought this old man now has come face to face with the realities of life 
that he is suffering from tuberculosis. And all that ecstasy, all that charm has disappeared because he knows what he is suffering from. That was the stupid ass's conclusion. <laughs> and I was abiding my time, caring for him, feeding him, bathing him, nursing him, this, 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 all that I used to do day in and day out. The first day goes, the night passes, no response. Second day, no response. Third day, third night, fourth day, fourth night. It became such a burden for me. I was in 26, not even 20, yeah, 20, how, what is, yeah, I was 23, 23 years old. And I was totally lost. What to do with this person? He's not at all responding. Don't know where he is living. What is wrong with him? After all, there's a saying there's an eternal hope. Why doesn't he hope that he will survive? That's why he's here. My conviction was so strong that this man facing death has lost his poise. I feel like kicking myself when I think of my attitude. On the fifth morning, he was absolutely his old self. After his breakfast and all that, he asked me to turn his bed facing towards the perennial snow of the Himalayas. Ah, what a wonderful view. And I sighed relief. Thank God he has again started things that are wonderful. I took courage. I wanted to be proved wrong that he has lost his cool, he has lost his courage because he now knows what he is suffering from. I wanted to be proved wrong, but I couldn't. My thinking was such, I thought this is what has happened to him. I took courage in both hands and I asked him, Maharaj, may I ask you a question? What is it, dear? This old charming self, what happened to you these four days? You were living elsewhere. I was serving your body, but you were somewhere else. You were lost to me. What happened? I wanted to hear from him what happened. He gives me a very, very charming, benign smile. Don't you know what happened? No, sir. I have the faintest idea, and that's why I'm asking you. Oh, dear, it's very funny. What's funny about it? As soon as I came to see that I am in a TV sanatorium, came to see that, and immediately I started thinking, I am the cause of violation of all normal concepts of health and personal hygiene. I am the cause of you being exposed to this disease and what I have done. I am at the fag end of my life and you have just started. What will happen if that infection spreads into you? I felt so bad I didn't know what to do. I have only one avenue open to me. And what did you do? What avenue was open to you? I started praying to the Divine Mother of the Universe, the Holy Mother Sri Sharada Devi, whom we know she is the Divine Mother of the Universe. I started praying to her. What did you pray, sir? What was your asking? 
Well, you don't understand even now. I said, no, sir. I was so conditioned by my own thinking that with all these indications, even then, I didn't understand. <coughs> he says, look, when I came to realize what risk you have taken, I thought it must be corrected. And there's no other way of correcting but through the help of the Divine Mother of the Universe. So I kept on praying and praying and praying and seeking her help to find out a way. And I kept on praying to the Mother that you are so kind, please give me a boon. <laughs> Bless me with such a boon which I can pass on to somebody. And last night, my mother came, and mother gave me this boon. What is that boon, Maharaj? You still don't understand. I said, no. I have only read in the epics and in the old stories that the gods did give boon to devotees. But this is the first time I'm hearing in my life. You know what boon I asked for? And my Divine Mother is so kind. What did you ask for, Maharaj? Are you fool, you stupid ass. I asked a boon that you may die of any disease under the sun. Let there not be a tuberculosis on you. I don't want to be blamed when I am dead and gone that I am the cause of ruination of your life. And believe me, friends, I am not exaggerating. This strenuous life pattern of nearly one year, I had started losing weight, I had developed a lack of appetite and a slight evening temperature. All the signs of the preliminary stage of this infection. And he tells me, and thereafter he had to leave that Kasoli TV station because he developed a hill diarrhea. It was a disease those days that was not known today. In the hills, the spring waters are sometimes very laxative in nature. And that water of that spring at Kasoli TV sanatorium, somehow or other, suited everybody, did not suit him. And he started purging. At that phase, there was no other way but to remove him from the hills to the plains. And he would recover. No medicines would help him. So it was almost an emergent situation. The hospital authorities sent a wire to Madhuanandaji Ji in Calcutta, Belurmat that your patient has to be removed because he has this, 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 this. Madhavananji wrote back to me, sent me aware that please hold, have courage, stick on, I am sending somebody to fetch you down to Kankal Haridwar. All that happened and ultimately with him I came back to Bedurmat. It has been nearly about 13 or 14 months now. As soon as he came to Belurmat, may I have a please few more minutes? Please, please, please. As soon as I came to Belurmat, President Maharaj Virajanandaji, his elder Guru Bhai, sends a word that ask again when I can come and call on him. It is at his convenience. Let him not bother about mine. So I carried the message to Maharaj, Khagan Maharaj Shantanandji. He wants to come and see you. What a shame. He will come to see me. I, I should go to him. But how can I go? I am in an isolation ward. He's aware of it now. Then do me a favor. Open up the doors. Fumigate it. Keep his chair far away from me in that corner. And eight feet by eight feet room. Far away from a corner. The childlike simplicity was really charming to behold, as if 
you belong to a different world altogether. That charm in sincere simplicity. I said, all right, you don't get excited. I'll organize, I'll organize. In the meantime, there was a word. He asked me, what would you like to do when you are separated from me? He knew the time for my being separated from him is approaching. I didn't know. I said, why should I separate from you? I have willingly, voluntarily I have done it. No, 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 no. Tell me, do you have any idea what will you do with yourself? I told him casually, just for the sake of saying, having served you, sir, the joy of serving a realized soul has intoxicated me. How I wish I could continue to serve, if at all separated from you, Virajananda Ji Maharaj, my guru, the president. Oh, is that so? Now Virajananda Ji arrives in his... It happened somewhere in Kasuli Hills. Just a casual chatting, that's all. I have forgotten it. Virajananda Ji comes and Shantananda Ji falls flat on his bed. He can't come down, there's no room in the house, <laughs> there's no space in the room. He falls flat on his bed doing pranams to Virajananda Ji and telling him, Sir, what have you done? You have come all the way from your room to my room and it is infected place. Please, you sit away from me. Don't come close to me. And he keeps on squeezing himself to the other corner of the room. And he is in that corner, and I'm in the third corner. <laughs> and Virajananda, he says in his charming manner, he has a wonderful conversation with Virajananda. He, he says in his charming manner, what do you think of me again? That was Shantanandaji's pet name. What do you think of me again? Am I so heartless? Am I so thoughtless? Am I so callous? My younger brother is ailing and is sick and he has come all the way from Kasoli and I will not come and see you. Don't think that I am so heartless, Kagen. It gives me pleasure to see you in your health. For all that sickness and illness and all that, the shine on his face never dimmed but those four days. So I was standing at the corner and I was listening and Shantanandaji started appreciating me in my presence to my guru. And what was his appreciation? He didn't care for his personal health. He didn't take any precautions. He never, he was never fear, afraid of dying. This and this and this. Maharaj, it is just because possible, because he is your disciple. And whenever he said, because he is your disciple, this repeated five or six times. Appreciating all that I have done for him, it is possible because he is your disciple. It is possible because it's your disciple. And I was scared and I was sweating. <laughs> <laughs> Swami Virajanandaji was known for his, I would say, <coughs> stern disciplinarian attitude. No exception. You must behave absolutely like a Franciscan monk. No deviation for discipline. And I was perspiring, is this the way to appreciate me? <laughs> Putting me on to gallows. <laughs> but one thing was evident which I could, didn't know. How could I make out? Every time Khagan Maharaj was saying, Sir, it has all been possible by this young chap just because he's your disciple. And I really felt as a father becomes proud 
when his son is being adored or admired, the father swells in pride. I felt Virajanandiji was swelling in pride. But after all this divine interaction between the two, Virajanandiji had brought a whole basket of fruits and sweets and etc., etc., gave to me and told me, take care of these, let them not get spoiled, feed him well, I am going now. All right, sir, you better go. <laughs> <laughs> better go, sir, that's enough for me for the day. And one thing he said, yeah, this chappy, he seems to be very fortunate, Kagan. He has enjoyed your confidence and he has enjoyed your company. He must be very, very fortunate. In typical Bengali, those you know, a colloquial Bengali, Chunata Radrishta Bhalu. Chunata Radrishta, Chuna is an achit. Uh, it's, a, it's said in affection. Yes, oh, he is a fortunate chappy. He went back home. Within 15 minutes, another Swami on Virajanandiji's staff comes running to me. Hey, what have you done? I said, no, I have done nothing. But <laughs> done. He has told me to inform you, Virajanandiji, has told me to inform you that you should present yourself to him at two o'clock in the afternoon after he finishes his lunch and after his bath. Okay. Why, why is he annoyed with me? Is he going to rebuke me? Is he going to take me to task? Well, 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 he was a bit clever than I was. <laughs> Well, 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 you will see it when it happens. And he left me there and ran away. On Adi Maharaj. And that is how I came close to Virajanandaji. Now, with this introduction, I will stop my memoirs. And I was in jitters. I have been asked to present myself and he, I know what he is. He was known for his exactitude, his stern disciplinarian, hard taskmaster, unforgiving, a pursuer of excellence in every phase of his life. All that was known to me. After all, he was my guru. I'm supposed to know about these things. I was really shaken. I don't know what is in my score. And now I'm sure Swamiji, President Maharaj, will send Shantanandaji to the Jadapur TV sanatorium and he will wean me away from Shantanandaji. I don't know what is in me and this is my state of health. I'll have to walk out of this organization. Anyway, time doesn't stop. Two o'clock came. <laughs> Two minutes before. I stood at the door. Just at two, the door opens, and that Swami who said, came to inform me calls me from inside. I went in, kept myself at far away, as far away as possible for him, from him, and I made my Shashtanga Pranam on my face. I stood up and slowly and slowly as far away from him, my back to the wall. <laughs> he was sitting in the room. He had just finished his hubble bubble, his tobacco, puffing it. Then I was standing. He looks at me. So you are, you are within your rights to look at me. <laughs> Why are you standing so far away? Come closer. So I come one step forward. Closer. I was almost near. He was sitting with his legs spread on a footstool. I was almost near his foot. Come closer. And 
And I thought, is he going to slap me or box my ears? <laughs> Believe me, that is precise. I was so scared. And then I knelt down at his, close to his knees. Yeah, I knelt down and he starts telling me, look, when Shantananda was praising you and appreciating you, believe me, my dear child, I was feeling proud of you. And I have thought over it. You deserve a prize. Now, all the pent-up energy thoughts in me that I might have to leave the organization, I would have exposed to it. I had already started my signs and symptoms of tuberculosis. So I have to, and he says he's going to give me a prize. It was so contradictory to my feeling for which I was prepared, and I was only 23 years old years, now I can understand. I just burst into tears and started sopping with my head down. <laughs> he was equally surprised. Are you dear? I am appreciating you. Why are you weeping? I am appreciating you. Are you amito to, to tarif kochi? To kanchishkan? He would, couldn't make out what was the reason of my weeping and sobbing. Then, spontaneously from the core of my heart, dears, I told him, sir, all this has been possible. As Shantanandaji said, it is because you are my guru. And I kept on. He could not contain himself. I saw tears in his eyes. They got hold of my head, drew it towards me, put it on his thighs, and kept on patting my head, telling me, dear, dear, calm down. I'm extremely pleased with you. I'm going to offer you a reward. Why are you still weeping, dear? And I collected myself. When I put my head up, I saw half of his dhoti, his, what he was wearing, was wet. And then he comes out with his reward. Now this is something enjoyable. <laughs> what a stupid ass I was that I have. <laughs> what happened? He now, he is also collected, I'm also collected, looking forward to what that reward is. Look, I have decided I'm going to reward you. From tomorrow morning, Shantananda will be sent to the Jadavpur TB hospital. You will have to be away from him. Enough is enough. Is that a reward? Is that a reward? He doesn't answer. The reward is you will be my shaver from tomorrow morning. Now listen to me. Oh no, sir, dear, no. I am told you are a stern taskmaster. <laughs> you are a strict disciplinarian. You are very exacting. None of your shavaks speak highly of your affectionate care. <laughs> Straight away. Spontaneously. And how do I justify myself? Sir, it is in the scriptures. If Ishtadev is annoyed with you, Guru protects you. If Guru is annoyed with you, there is nobody to protect you. If you get annoyed with me, where do I go? In one go, I blurted out. He was absolutely quizzed, as it were. 
she was listening and hearing, but enjoying my stupidity. <laughs> and after I have exhausted myself, he tells me, how long you are in this organization, my dear? Why, sir, 18 months. 18 months. It's wonderful. In 18 months, you have studied my horoscope thoroughly. <laughs> then he becomes a grave. What a personality. Then he becomes grave. Now look, dear, to live with this disrepute and to die with this disrepute <laughs> is insufferable for me. Do kindly give me a chance to prove you wrong. <laughs> this is Guru Shishya Shonbad for you. The intra first interaction between the guru and the disciple. It is, please, <laughs> it's very, very difficult to live with this disrepute and to die with it is worse. Please kindly give me a chance to prove you wrong. <laughs> you come tomorrow morning. But that was not the end of it. There's a little something left, and then I'll stop. <laughs> I told him with all seriousness that I could command. I said, sir, there's one condition. Well, why one, dear, as many as you want to. Please agree. So I told him, sir, this is what I know of you. I am prepared to risk my life with you. I don't risk my life with you. What is the condition? You personally, without any involvement of any shevak, you personally will teach me how to serve you and how you will be happy with me. That is very simple, he says. That is what I propose to do with you. I will take charge of you. I will tell you how to sweep my room, how to mop my floor, how to make my bed, how to look after me, how to deal with me. It's my business to teach you. It's a fair deal. I said, sir, for the first 15 days, you will not rebuke me. I will get nervous. So for 15 days, you will not rebuke me. From the 16th day, treat me with the harshest possible discipline that you can. I'm game for it. He says, it's a fair deal. Again, repeats, tomorrow morning, you start your duties. That is how, dears, from Shantanandaji, one realized soul to another soul whom I could not fathom even today. The depth of his personality, the spiritual dimension of that personality, the intensity and the extensity of that person, immeasurable. And that is how my life started with him, and it ended three and a half years later on 30th of May, 1951. He passed away at 6.03 hours in the morning. An endless interaction with such a realized soul. For I can divide it into three phases. First phase was physical toughening. Second phase was 
holding on to principles, paying whatever price it is required. And third was to expose himself how a knower of Brahman departs and lord me from this world. At those three and a half years, when I remember myself, I can categorize one part was absolute toughness. I asked him, why are you so inconsiderate, sir? Why don't you have a little compassion? It is in your own welfare, dear. Promptly. How come you move in this gross world? If I don't force you to develop that habit of perfection, how will you learn to meditate perfectly if that habit of perfection is not created in the gross life? How do you think you'll meditate perfectly in that abstract world of ideas? So the force of habit to do things perfectly will help you to meditate perfectly. That was the first toughening. Second toughening was you must pay any price that is called to stick on to your principles of life. <laughs> and the third was the way in a lordly manner he departs from the world. It was not a deathbed. It was a whole ambiance of festivity, spiritual festivity. There was not a single person in whole of Belurmat who was weeping or shedding tear that Kalikishra Maharaj is dying. <laughs> Kalikishra Maharaj is going into Mahasamadhi. It's a matter of festivity. And we find in the Upanishads, Natasya prana utkramante pradipa nirvanavat purishamanta tavatishtate. They don't die. The burning light slowly and slowly disappears and the carbon particles spread all over the world. That's what that is. So, dears, seeking the blessings of these realized souls, let us part for tonight. May God bless you all. Thank you.